welcome. Uh, it's great to see everybody here uh, at this great university. As I was just saying to someone, I've been here for 29 years this August. Uh, it's the only university. <laughs> the only university that I've ever taught at, which is actually quite uh, unusual for uh, people of my generation. Most of my friends have taught at at least two or three universities. So uh, I think I will have started here and finished here, uh, which is a wonderful thing. Uh, the subject I want to talk about today is American foreign policy and where we are. And I want to start off by just reminding everyone in the audience of where we were when the Cold War ended uh, in the early uh, 1990s. Of course, it ended in, in 1989, but it was really in the 1990s that uh, it played itself out. And as almost all of you remember, that was a period of great euphoria. Uh, we thought we basically uh, had the world in our hands and uh, we were on the march and nothing but good would happen. And indeed, many people were talking about a fundamental transformation in international politics that would work to America's advantage. I think the two paradigmatic pieces from the time uh, were number one, Frank Fukuyama's very famous article in uh, the National Interest entitled uh, The End of History, which was actually a lecture that he gave here in Social Science 122. He was invited by Alan Bloom, who was his teacher in college at Cornell. And Frank gave that lecture here, and it eventually became an article and a famous book. And the other article was Charles Krauthammer's uh, famous piece in foreign affairs called The Unipolar Moment. Let me say a few words about each of those pieces because they were so important at the time, and they say so much about what has happened over the next 20 plus years. Fukuyama argued in his piece that the United States, as a liberal democracy, uh, had defeated fascism in the first half of the 20th century, and then we had defeated communism in the second half. And the end result is that liberal democracy had emerged triumphant. And his basic argument was that liberal democracy was going to spread over the rest of the globe. And the end result would be that we would live in a world that was populated by states that had a lot in common with the United States. And since most Americans believe we're the good guys and anybody who looks like us by definition must be a good guy, Fukuyama hypothesized that the biggest problem that we would face in the future would be boredom. And we would, <laughs> would be plagued by boredom. I know those sounds like funny words. We'd be plagued by boredom because it would be such a peaceful world, because a world made up of liberal democracies can't be anything but a peaceful world. I think even more importantly, what he was arguing quite explicitly was that we had the wind at our back. Uh, in other words, democracy was on the march. And slowly but steadily, over the course of time, the rest of the world would look like the United States and Western Europe. Uh, there was going to be no more fascism, no more communism, no more authoritarianism. Slowly but steadily, um, those political systems would disappear. That was one piece. The other piece, written by another neoconservative, both of them were neoconservatives at the time. Fukuyama no longer identifies as a neoconservative. Krauthammer still does. But both of them were very prominent neocons at the time. But Krauthammer argued in his famous piece the unipolar moment, that we had emerged from the Cold War as the most powerful state on the planet by far. He argued, and many others argued quite correctly, that we had never really seen a country that was as powerful as the United States. And it was not only economically powerful, it was militarily powerful. And of course, to go to the Fukuyama argument, which meshes very well with the Krauthammer argument, uh, what Frank was saying was that we had this remarkably attractive ideology. So not only did we have all this power, uh, but we had an attractive ideology as well. And not surprisingly, and I'll argue about this in more detail as we go along, what happens over the course of the next 20 plus years is that the Fukuyama argument and the Krauthammer argument get married together, 
and we use that big stick that Krauthammer describes, right, to push forward the process that uh, Fukuyama said uh, is inevitable. In other words, we use that military force at our disposal whenever we could uh, to facilitate the spread of liberal democracy across the globe, all in the belief that this would be good for the United States. Of course, it has not worked out very well, and we are in a hell of a lot of trouble today. And I won't go into this, but it's only going to get worse with the passage of time. Uh, none of these problems that Obama faces are solvable, uh, at least the way we would like to solve them. Just to go over what I think are the five big problems facing us. Uh, first of all, there are the two wars, Afghanistan uh, and uh, Iraq. We're going to lose both of those wars. Uh, it's just a matter of time. And uh, we've been in both of them for a long, long time. Uh, and then the third problem is the Iranian nuclear program. Uh, and I'll talk about all of these in a bit more detail as we go along. But on the Iranian nuclear program, uh, we're dedicated to shutting down their efforts to develop the nuclear fuel cycle. I don't believe that there's any good evidence that they're developing nuclear weapons. Uh, Seymour Hersh has a piece in the New Yorker that I think has it right. Despite all the talk about Iranian nuclear weapons, no evidence to support it. Uh, but in a funny way, it doesn't matter because if you develop the full nuclear fuel cycle, you're so close to having nuclear weapons that it's just a short jump to weaponizing. So if the, Irani if the Iranians had been smart from the beginning, they would have just done this out in the open and made it clear to everybody what they were doing, developed the full nuclear fuel cycle which is perfectly legitimate. They've signed an NPT, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, which allows them to develop the full nuclear fuel cycle. But again, once you develop the full nuclear fuel cycle, you're very close to nuclear weapons. Uh, but uh, the, the problem is Obama wants to shut down the nuclear fuel cycle, and he's not going to do that. And in fact, I believe there's a good chance that they'll end up weaponizing. I think they'd be fools not to weaponize. I often tell audiences that if I was Akman Inejad's national security advisor and he asked me what to do, I'd weaponize, right? I'd just tell the West, you're not going to take your gun sights off me, I'm going to weaponize. Uh, fourth problem we face is the North Korean nuclear program. Uh, we tried to stop North Korea from acquiring nuclear weapons in the 90s. We failed. Uh, and now they have nuclear weapons. And the Obama administration would like to get them to give up their nuclear weapons, but we can't do that. It just hasn't worked. And then the fifth problem is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, where the Obama administration, much like the Bush administration, and before that the Clinton administration, is deeply dedicated to two-state solution. Uh, and as you, or most of you know, there was a big fight between President Obama and Prime Minister Netanyahu over the borders, the whole question of whether Israel was going to go back to the 67 borders, that there were going to be minor modifications. This was all a smokescreen. That's not the nature of the fight between the two of them. The nature of the fight is over whether there's going to be two states or not. Benjamin Netanyahu was elected on the platform that there would be no two-state solution. His government is filled with people who are opposed to a two-state solution. And uh, Obama, of course, wants a two-state solution. But Obama's not going to get a two-state solution, not going to be a two-state solution. Uh, so we're going to fail there, too. So basically, if you look at where we are today, we're in two wars, maybe even three if you want to count Libya, but I'm not going to talk about Libya. We're in two wars, Iraq and Afghanistan, where we're going to lose. Uh, number three, we can't shut down the Iranian nuclear program. Number four, we can't get North Korea to give up its nuclear weapons. And number five, we can't get a two-state solution uh, to settle the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So we're sort of zero for five. Uh, all of that great enthusiasm, all that talk about how powerful we were, uh, all of that talk about how we had the wind at our back, it's not turned out very well at all. And of course, on top of all of this, we have huge budget deficits. and. Uh, all sorts of other problems in the country. So the question you want to ask yourself is, what went wrong here? I mean, it's really 
I think the question of the day, and by the way, the same question applies on the economic front. If you think about what the economy looked like when Bill Clinton handed it over to George Bush in 2001, and then you look at where we are today, something fundamentally wrong happened. What was it? I mean, how did we end up in this mess? And of course, the same applies on the foreign policy front. And what I want to do is just give you my best take on why we ended up in the mess that we're in today. I believe it's a function of the grand strategy that we chose. Some people might like the word foreign policy instead of grand strategy, but in the world I operate in, we refer to it as grand strategy. And the United States has basically a choice among four grand strategies. And what I want to do is I want to lay out each of those grand strategies for you and then explain to you which one we took and then why we got ourselves into a heap of a lot of trouble, okay? Uh, first grand strategy that the United States can choose is isolationism, which as many of you know was what the United States chose pretty much up until 1941 when we went into World War II. Uh, isolationism is not a viable strategy today, but the logic that underpins isolationism is very powerful. In this room, when I teach students, I always say you want to pay very serious attention to the logic underpinning isolationism. The re reason that Franklin D. Roosevelt had such enormous difficulty defeating the isolationists in the 30s and very early 40s was because there's a powerful logic that underpins it. And isolationism basically says that the United States is physically separated from those areas of the world that have other great powers by giant moats called the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. And because it's almost impossible to cross those moats and attack the United States, we are remarkably secure. And when you marry that simple fact with the fact that we have thousands of nuclear weapons, it's hard to see why we should care who dominates Europe or who dominates Asia. So what if Imperial Germany or Nazi Germany dominates Europe? They can't get at us. So what if Imperial Japan or some future Chinese threat dominates China? How are they going to get across the Pacific Ocean? As you all know, the Pacific Ocean is 6,000 miles wide. You think there's going to be a Normandy-like invasion on the California beaches as the Chinese Navy transports troops 6,000 miles across the Pacific Ocean? Not going to happen. It's that kind of logic that underpins isolationism. Hard to argue against. This is what Roosevelt was up against. I'm not an isolationist. That's the first choice. Second choice, which is my favorite, and which I'll talk about later on, is what's called offshore balancing. Offshore balancers like me believe that there are three areas of the world that really matter. Europe, Northeast Asia, and the Persian Gulf. Europe and Northeast Asia matter because that's where the great powers are and they're potential threats to the United States. And the Middle East or the Persian Gulf matters because that's where oil is. And oil is a critical resource like none other, okay? So we have to care about the Gulf. Those are the three areas that Americans should be willing to fight and die over. Then the question becomes, how do you fight and die in those areas? When do you fight and die in those areas? My argument is you build military forces to fight in those areas, but you don't go into those areas unless there's one country in the region that threatens to dominate it, to take it over, to become what I would call a regional hegemon. You go to war against Imperial Germany in 1970, 17, you go to war against Nazi Germany in 1941, you stay in Europe after World War II to deal with the Soviet threat, you go to war in the Pacific in December 1941 to deal with Imperial Japan. Those are potential threats to the United States because there's a serious possibility they'll dominate the entire region, which is not in America's interest. Otherwise, you stay offshore. That's offshore balancing. Again, three areas of the world that matter. Three areas of the world that are worth fighting and dying for, and you only fight and die in those regions where there's a potential hegemon that needs to be contained and where you're essential to make containment work. 
third strategy. First is isolationism, second is offshore balancing. The third is called selective engagement. Selective engagement says that there are three areas of the world that matter. John is correct. Those three areas of the world matter. But it's our job to keep the peace in those areas. It's not only our job to deal with a potential hegemon, that's offshore balancing. It's our job to be in the region to keep peace. Let me give you an example. When the Cold War ended, Soviet Union went away. John said, as an offshore balancer, let's get out of Europe. I'd pull everything out of Europe. I'd pull everything out of Europe. There's no potential hegemon in the region, right? I'd take everything out. The idea that we're spending absurd amounts of money to defend rich Europeans who have wonderful infrastructure while our infrastructure is going to hell in a handbasket drives me crazy. Let the Europeans defend themselves. If Adolf Hitler comes back from the dead, Germany goes on another rearmament campaign, then I'm willing to come back in. But absent that, I stay out. I let them pay for themselves. I'm an offshore balancer. Most of my realist friends disagree with me. They say, John, we have to stay in Europe to keep the peace. The Europeans are dangerous to themselves and ultimately dangerous to us. Let's stay over there and play the role of Uncle Sugar Daddy. Okay? That's selective engagement. It's selective because they think the three areas of the world matter, like the offshore balancers think. It's just that they favor maintaining peace over dealing with potential hegemons. Okay? So it's isolationism, offshore balancing, selective engagement. Then we come to the fourth grand strategy, which is the most important for my story, global domination. And this is the idea that the United States should dominate the globe. There are no three important areas. All areas are important. You dominate the globe. You're willing to use military force anywhere. I think this view is best captured by Madeleine Albright's famous or infamous, depending on your viewpoint, comments that we are the indispensable nation. We stand taller and we see further. This is Madeleine Albright basically saying that we not only have a right, but we have a responsibility to run the world. We have the right to stick our nose in everybody else's business. Right. Global domination. Global domination is the grand strategy that we adopted after 1989. And it remains our grand strategy. We believe that we have a responsibility to run the world. It's imperial by design. Now, very importantly, there are two kinds of global dominators. One are the neoconservatives who are aligned in large part with the Republican Party and two are the liberal imperialists who are aligned with the Democratic Party. And let me tell you what the difference between the two is. The difference is that the neoconservatives hate international institutions and privilege the unilateral use of military force. The liberal imperialists, on the other hand, love international institutions. They're always talking about multilateralism, which is a euphemism for institutions. They love international institutions, and they're not unwilling to use military force, but they're quite skittish. Think about Bill Clinton in the 1990s. Bill Clinton had an administration that was filled with global dominators, as did George W. Bush, his successor. But Bill Clinton had liberal imperialists driving the train. You remember, Bill Clinton refused to use ground forces against Bosnia in 1995, or in Bosnia in 1995, or against Serbia in the war over Kosovo in 1999. Very reluctant to get too involved. You remember what happened in Somalia when those soldiers were killed? We quickly cut and ran. And then the next year, that was 1993, the next year, 1994, we sat out the genocide in Rwanda because we were so spooked. The liberal imperialists were so spooked by what happened in Somalia. Right? 
And every time we used military force, we tried to do it multilaterally. We wanted allies to get involved, right? We wanted to work through institutions like the UN and NATO and so forth and so on. But the goal was global domination. After September 11th, the neoconservative strand of global domination moved to the fore. And you all remember the Bush doctrine, you remember the rhetoric after Afghanistan fell and before we went into Iraq, where we believed that we could act unilaterally with our military force to reshape the world in our own image. This is Fukuyama and Krauthammer coming home to roost, right? It's the idea that the United States has this incredibly powerful military, right, and the wind at its back, and doesn't need allies, because we're not going to do it diplomatically. We're going to do it with the big stick. And we, we have a stick that's so big that we don't need a lot of help. Most of you probably don't remember this, but right before the Iraq War, which started on March 19, 2003, George Bush dialed up Tony Blair, and he told Tony, if you don't want to go with us, you don't have to go. Because he knew that Tony Blair was the only guy in Britain who wanted to go. Virtually everybody else in Britain thought this was a Looney Tunes operation, including everybody in his government. But Tony wanted to go. Bush didn't want to get him in trouble. Bush called him up, says, you don't have to go if you don't want. And the reason he called him up and said that was because we didn't need him. The American military could do it pretty much by itself. And we took Saddam down very easily. Right? So it's the whole idea that you can do things unilaterally. If you have doubts about military force and you have to use diplomacy, where you think that the military operation is going to get messy, then you need allies. And of course, think about what happened once Iraq or once Afghanistan goes south. Then we start begging everybody to come and help us police the place, because it's a mess and you need help. But if you believe the big stick is going to you know, produce quick and decisive victories, to put it in Muhammad Ali's terms, you believe it's gonna allow you to float like a butterfly and sting like a bee? You do not need lots of allies. And that's the neoconservative worldview. Unilateralism, not multilateralism, and the big stick. And that's what you see with Republicans. Democrats, both in the 1990s under Bill Clinton and now under Barack Obama, they're interested in global dominance, just like the neocons. But the difference is the liberal Democrats uh, are uh, more skittish about military force. Okay, the key event that really flips us is September 11th. And after September 11th, which happened shortly after Bush gets elected, the, uh, uh, the neoconservatives really uh, are able to convince uh, key players in the Bush administration that they have the magic formula, which is again a combination of the Fukuyama Krauthammer worldview. Of course, this ends up not working, and we're in the mess that we see before us today, and that I described at the beginning of this talk. Now, the question is what went wrong? H how did we end up in such a mess? The argument I want to make is that we made three fundamental errors. Number one, we misunderstood the terrorist threat. Number two, we did not have a healthy appreciation of the limits of military force. And number three, and most remarkably, we did not understand how difficult it was to spread democracy at the end of a rifle barrel. The three different flaws in this grand strategy. And before I go on, I want to make a quick point. As I said to you, there is this divide among the global dominators between the neoconservatives and the liberal imperialists. But you want to remember that after September 11th and after the war in Afghanistan, when Bush was pushing us to go to war against Iraq, that he had much support from Democrats. He had much support from the liberal imperialists. I'm going to explain why this is the case in due course. But the idea that Bush 
went to war and the liberal imperialists opposed him is simply wrong. You all understand that George Bush, I mean, excuse me, Barack Obama does not have a single foreign policy advisor who opposed the Iraq war. Every single one of Barack Obama's advisors favored the Iraq war. The only person in that administration who was opposed to the war was Barack Obama himself. Right. This just shows you the extent to which the liberal imperialists and the neoconservatives came together. And it happened after Afghanistan. I'll talk about that in due course. OK. First, let's just talk about the terrorist threat and how we blew that. Three ways we blew it. First of all, Bush says that the threat is global. In other words, we have to go after every terrorist organization on the planet. And furthermore, he says that states like Iraq, Iran, Syria, this is the famous or infamous axis of evil, those states, what are sometimes called rogue states, are inextricably linked or tied to terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda. So Bush says, not only do we have to take out every terrorist group on the planet, we've got to take out rogue states too, because they're joined at the hip with these terrorist organizations. This is crazy. First of all, there are terrorist groups all over the planet. Beating them is very difficult, as we've discovered with Al-Qaeda. It can be done, but it's very difficult. The idea that you're going to take on all of these terrorist groups at once is really asking for trouble. Furthermore, the idea that states like Iraq, Iran, and Syria are friendly with Al-Qaeda is simply wrong. Iran helped us defeat the Taliban in Afghanistan in the fall of 2001. Syria, as Seymour Hersh has documented in The New Yorker, played a key role in cooperating with us to defeat some terrorist attacks after September 11th. And there was no evidence, despite prodigious efforts by the Bush administration to show otherwise, that Saddam and Osama bin Laden were linked at the hip. In fact, they didn't like each other at all. So the idea that we had to take out rogue states because they were joined at the hip with terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda was simply wrong. In fact, they would have been important allies in that fight. And again, the last thing you wanted to do was take on terrorist groups that didn't have their gun sights on you. So that's one mistake we made. Another mistake we made is we just greatly overestimated how dangerous the threat was. I mean, there's no question that we got whacked good on September 11th. Nobody would deny that. It was a devastating attack. But it was never duplicated. They've never come close. What's the terrorist threat that we have faced since September 11th? The shoe bomber? The underwear bomber? Telling me we're spending more money than the rest of the world put together on defense to deal with the shoe bomber? The underwear bomber? Is there a terrorist threat that we face? Of course there is. Is it a serious threat? Yes. How serious? Not that serious. I'm sorry. Right. Does not justify all the hype that we've heard since September 11th. And we've had constant references to imminent attacks. There's been no imminent attacks, nothing close to an imminent attack. So number one, they enlarged the target to the point where it became almost impossible to win. Number two, they greatly overestimated how dangerous these terrorist groups are. And number three, and most importantly, they misunderstood why they hate us. This is a key issue. The question is, why did they attack us on September 11th? Why do they hate us? There are two possible answers. They hate us because of who we are, or they hate us because of our policies. Those are the only two possible answers. Okay. We, of course, were not going to say they hated us because of our policies in the wake of September 11th, because if they hated us because of our policies, then we, in part, would have, been to blame, would have been to blame for what happened on September 11th. So we had to tell the story that they hated us because of who we are. They hate our democratic values. They hate the fact that we treat women as equals, and so forth and so on. You know the litany of charges. The truth is, there is a huge amount of survey data on this. There is a huge amount of anecdotal evidence on this. 
And they don't hate us because of who we are. They hate us because of our policies. Okay? But we said they hate us because of who we are. Right. Now think about this. Remember the Bush Doctrine. What was the Bush Doctrine all about? The Bush Doctrine was all about going into the Middle East and turning countries like Iraq into democracies. It was all about speeding up the Fukuyama process, right? In other words, what we were saying is, if they hate us because of who we are, we can't change who we are, so we're going to change who they are. We're going to make them look like us. I was adamantly opposed to the Iraq war, as many of you know, and I have many conservative friends, and I used to say to them in the run-up to the war, how can conservatives like you support this war? And they would say, why aren't you supporting this war, right? You're a conservative. And I'd say, anybody who's got a conservative bone in their body should be opposed to this whole operation because it's social engineering on a grand scale. This is one of the most radical foreign policy endeavors I've ever seen in my life. The idea that a bunch of white people are going to come across the Atlantic Ocean and do massive social engineering in the Arab and Islamic world at the end of a rifle barrel? That's a conservative policy? <laughs> Not on the planet I come from. Right? This is, you know, nutty, right? But, but again, if you have come to the conclusion that it's not our policies and you do not want to change our policies and instead you believe it's due to the fact that they hate democracy and who we are, then you change who they are. And that's what the Bush doctrine was all about. This is a fundamental mistake. What they really hated, right, was number one, the fact that we had troops in Saudi Arabia People in the Arab and Islamic world do not like us occupying their territory. So, of course, we now have troops in Afghanistan and Iraq. There was no al-Qaeda problem in Iraq until we went in there. Now there's our al-Qaeda in Mesopotamia, right? They hate us because of sanctions on Iraq in the 1990s that killed probably about 500,000 innocent Iraqis. They hate us because of our support for Israel and its occupation of the Palestinian territories. Right? They hate us because we have supported all these thuggish governments in the Middle East for decades. Barack Obama pretends like we're embracing democracy, like we're this great friend of democracy in the Middle East. Who is he kidding? We've been supporting these thugs. We helped put many of them in power. We've kept them there for years. We've been no friend of democracy in the Middle East. One of the principal reasons there's no democracy in the Middle East is the United States of America. Everybody knows that. But the people in that region don't like our policies. You can disagree with them, but they don't like the policies. And actually, many of them like the United States and like American values. Anyway, so we misread the threat. Second is we did not understand the limits of military force. And this is of enormous importance, too. After the war in Afghanistan appeared, I underline that word, appeared to have ended in December 2001. Remember, we went to war in Afghanistan against the Taliban on October 7, 2001. Okay, less than a month after September 11th. By early December, the Taliban had completely collapsed. And that's when we were trying to get Osama bin Laden. You all remember that. It looked like we had won a stunning victory. It looked like we had the magic formula. And what allowed us to think that we could go into Iraq and win quickly and easily and what brought the liberal imperialists on board to the enterprise was the belief that Afghanistan had demonstrated that small numbers of American ground forces combined with sophisticated aircraft with smart bombs working with local forces could bring down the Taliban, bring down Saddam. And we could float like a butterfly and sting like a bee. I used to say to people, if you could convince me we could bring down Saddam in two weeks, 
you know, hardly any casualties and install a democracy, I'm in favor of doing it, right? You tell me you've got a magic formula for taking out the Iranian nuclear program forever, I'm for it, right? <laughs> the problem is we don't have that, right? But anyway, back to Afghanistan. What we had in December 2001 was not a victory. It was a mirage. It was a mirage. I did not understand this at the time, I'm embarrassed to say. But we did not win a quick and decisive victory. Here's the problem we faced in Afghanistan. The problem is we could not decisively defeat the Taliban. When I was young in the American military during the Vietnam years, this was the problem that we faced. We could never decisively defeat the Viet Cong, right? You could whack them good, but they'd melt away and come back to fight another day. So what happens in Afghanistan in December 2001 is that we whacked the Taliban, really crippled them, and they disappear into the countryside, and they disappear into Pakistan. But they're going to come back another day to fight. Second reason we can't win in Afghanistan is that the man that we put in charge in Kabul is Ahmed Karzai, who's number one, a crook, and number two, massively incompetent. That means that when the Taliban come back from the dead, the Karzai government is not going to be able to deal with the Taliban. So who do you think is going to have to deal with the Taliban? Uncle Sugar. Yes. So if you chart American forces in Afghanistan, you know, it's just gone like this over time, up and up and up. As you know, Obama has greatly increased the number of American troops in Afghanistan years after the war was supposed to have been won. Why? Because the Taliban came back from the dead. The Karzai government can't deal with it. Now, to take this a step further, again, for Vietnam, we know that when you are fighting on behalf of a government in Saigon or Kabul that has no legitimacy, you have no legitimacy. You are seen as an occupier. And furthermore, everybody kind of knows at some point you're going to leave and the Taliban is going to stay. So they're going to be very reluctant to work with you. And this is the problem we face. So what happened is that we ended up thinking we had won a great victory in Afghanistan and we were going to duplicate that in Iraq. In fact, what happened in Afghanistan is we won a temporary victory, which would eventually go south again, and then we went traipsing off to Iraq, where we thought we were going to win another quick victory because we had just proved that we had the magic formula, when in fact we didn't have the magic formula. So there we are in Afghanistan, and there almost everybody I know believes it's just a matter of time before we lose. And in Iraq, the only thing we can hope for is that they throw us out at the end of this year. We're doing our best to stay there, right, because we understand that once we leave, all hell will break loose. So we want to stay, but they don't want us to stay, it appears. But we may end up staying. But either way, total mess. Two wars, total messes. One footnote to this. There are some people who argue that the problem is that we didn't have the right counterinsurgency doctrine, and once we got the right counterinsurgency doctrine in December of 2006 with the new field manual 3-24, and then we had the surge a month later in January 2007, we had finally figured out what to do, and now we're in really good shape in Iraq. Let's assume that that's true and that John's story that we're in trouble in Iraq is wrong. Okay, let's just assume that. The problem, nevertheless, is that to win a counterinsurgency, whether you're the British in Malaysia, the Americans in Vietnam, or the Americans in Afghanistan and Iraq, the problem is that it takes well over 10 years to win a counterinsurgency, assuming you can do it. But if it takes you 10 years, you cannot float like a butterfly and sting like a bee. And floating like a butterfly and stinging like a bee was the key to the Bush doctrine. Because we were going to do Afghanistan, then we were going to do Iraq. Pull back out, reload the shotgun, do Iran, do Syria. 
pretty soon everybody would be so scared they'd just throw their hands up and jump on the American bandwagon. You know, the Israelis, when they heard in early 2002, remember Afghanistan, we're talking December 2001, early 2002, the Israelis uh, catch, get wind that we're thinking of doing Iraq. And they send a team over here to say, are you guys crazy? Iran is the real threat, not Iraq. Why aren't you doing Iran? What we convinced the Israelis is that we're going to do Iraq first, because it's the low-hanging fruit, and then we're going to do Iran, and then we're going to do Syria, right? So the Israelis actually get on board for doing Iraq, but they keep reminding us, don't forget, when you're done with Iraq, you've got to do Iran, right? And see, we say, don't worry, not only are we going to do Iran, we're going to do Syria. Because again, the name of the game here is to transform the entire region. It gets back to that question, why do they hate us? If you think about it, they hate us because of who we are, therefore we have to transform, who, transform them and change who they are. And we think we can do it with military force. But again, what happened in Afghanistan was a mirage. And that's why all these Democrats were fools to abandon their skepticism about military force. My final point, uh, spreading democracy. This is quite amazing. There is a huge literature in the social sciences that comes to one clear conclusion. That, that doesn't often happen in the social sciences, right? I can tell you. <laughs> It's very easy whenever you teach on any subject to put out pieces by people on one side and people on the other side, right? But with regard to the question of how easy it is to spread democracy, the literature is clear. It is remarkably difficult to do. People will say, well, what about Germany and Japan? Well, Germany and Japan are exceptions. They're modern, industrialized countries. And in the case of Germany, they had a lot of history with democracy. Remember Weimar Germany? So once we went in there and destroyed the place, and we literally destroyed both of those countries in World War II, Japan and Germany, given the infrastructure they had, given their histories, it was rather easy to create a democracy. It was actually rather easy. But if you're talking about creating democracy in Afghanistan, creating democracy in Iraq, right? And you look at the centrifugal forces that are at play in countries like Iraq, this is gonna be a very tricky situation. I mean, what's amazing about the Bush administration is they thought that this would happen lickety split. This is why they thought they could float like a butterfly and sting like a bee. Their basic view was that we were going to do in the Middle East what happened in Eastern Europe in 1989. You all remember when the Soviet Union pulls out of East, or they don't actually pull out at the moment, but when the Cold War ends and the Soviets start pulling out of Eastern Europe, most of the Eastern European countries emerge as democracies, imperfect democracies, but nevertheless democracies. So the basic Bush slash neoconservative worldview is that if you topple tyrants like Saddam Hussein, that democracy will just break out. This sort of gets to the Frank Fukuyama line of thesis. But Frank Fukuyama, much to his credit, opposed the Iraq war. He thought the Iraq war was a bad idea. He thought that democracy would eventually spread across the globe, but it would take time. And in places like in Iraq and Afghanistan and the Middle East more generally, right, it would be a function of what was happening inside those countries, not American military force. But anyway, because we misread the terrorist threat, number one. Number two, because we misread what happened in Afghanistan and we did not have a healthy appreciation of the limits of military force, we got ourselves into trouble in both Afghanistan and in Iraq. And then finally, because we did not appreciate how difficult it is to spread democracy we found out that it was impossible to create democracy in Iraq and Afghanistan quickly so that we again could get out and move on to the next target. So I think those are the factors that explain why we are in so much trouble today.
And the more general point that I tried to make was that the reason we are in trouble is because we adopted this grand strategy of global dominance after 1989. And global dominance is, in my opinion, a remarkably foolish strategy because it's impossible for any country, the United States included, to run the entire globe. And it's especially difficult, if not impossible, to do that if you try and do it at the end of a rifle barrel. Thank you.